In the previous video, we developed this model for the sales and operations planning problem. And we uh, identified the decision variables, created the workforce and capacity model, and then the production and inventory model, as well as the cost model. Now, I'm going to put back in uh, just some starting values for the decision variables, because until we use solver, these were just some, some random values that were in there. Until we use solver, it'd be best just to have some starting values in. So I'll use 10 for workers hired, 5 for workers fired, 100 for overtime hours, and 3,000 for uh, units produced. Now what we need to do is consider uh, the constraints for this problem. So we're going to formulate the constraints down here at the bottom. And there's seven possible constraints that we might consider. They won't be present all in all problems, and there could be others, but these are the ones we'll build in initially. So the first constraint is going to be that we want to meet demand on time. And so if we look up here at the production inventory model, Recall that the units available to meet demand is made up of two components. We have the beginning inventory that was on hand at the beginning of the month, and then any units produced during the month. And potentially we could use both of those to meet demand. So we need these units available for, to meet demand to be greater than the demand that we forecast up here on uh, line two. So in general, the constraint is that available to meet demand is greater than or equal to demand. Now, we have to be a little bit creative in the way we formulate these constraints in the sales and operations planning problem. Notice that if we took this statement and subtracted demand from both sides, we would just have that available to meet demand minus demand is greater than zero. And what we notice about this statement on the left is that the ending inventory is also calculated as units available to meet demand minus demand. So our constraint then is going to be, so in other words, this quantity on the left is just ending inventory. So if ending inventory is greater than zero, then we're going to meet demand on time. So here on the line for constraint one, we're just going to reference ending inventory, which is in cell B40, and copy that over to all months, and then the constraint will be that ending inventory in all of the months is greater than or equal to zero, which is what our constraint right here says. All right, the second constraint is going to be that uh, production cannot exceed production capacity. So we'll call this the production capacity constraint. So in other words, uh, the constraint really is that production capacity has to be greater than or equal to the units produced. This will ensure that we don't go over capacity. Now we could also rewrite that if we subtracted units produced from both sides. We could, we could do that and that would mean that production capacity minus units produced is greater than or equal to zero. So what we'll do here on the line for this constraint is just take our production capacity, which is on line 34, minus our units produced. And then as you can see with all these constraints, we'll have greater than or equal to on the right hand side. So we'll copy that across. and greater than or equal to zero.
We're formulating these way, these constraints this way, because all of them will be greater than or equal to zero and allow us to make the solver entry very simple for these constraints. Now, in this model, we've got a maximum hiring constraint. And so the constraint is that uh, the workers hired has to be less than or equal to the maximum hires per month. And notice that we could just switch the inequality on that. We could say maximum hires per month is greater than or equal to workers hired. But because we're formulating all these constraints so that the right hand side is zero, we'll subtract workers hired from both sides. And we'll have maximum hires per month minus workers hired greater than or equal to zero. So on this line three, We'll have the maximum hires per month. That's up here in the assumptions. And then minus the workers hired, which is the decision variable on line 22. And that for every month needs to be greater than or equal to zero. All right, the next constraint is the maximum overtime constraint. So in this case, we want the overtime hours assigned to be less than or equal to the maximum overtime hours. Or if we wanted to flip that inequality, we could say that the maximum overtime hours per month are greater than or equal to the overtime hours assigned. And then because we want zero on the right hand side of all these constraints, we can subtract overtime hours assigned from both sides. And this will be greater than or equal to zero. So we'll enter right here on line four, maximum overtime hours minus overtime hours assigned. Maximum overtime hours is here on line 32, and the overtime hours assigned is the decision variable on line 24. For every month, that needs to be greater than or equal to zero. All right, the next constraint is on the storage capacity. And the constraint is that uh, the storage capacity has to be greater than or equal to the ending inventory. Notice I didn't write it out both ways, but that also means that the ending inventory has to be less than or equal to the storage capacity. And to put both uh, zero on this, uh, the right side of all constraints, we can subtract ending inventory on both sides. And the constraint is that storage capacity minus ending inventory is greater than or equal to zero. So we'll calculate this value up on the constraint uh, line for line five. And so that would be storage capacity minus ending inventory. And then we'll copy that over for each month. And that'll be greater than or equal to zero. Now we've got two more constraints. And these constraints are going to be on the uh, capacity buffer and the inventory buffer. So we'll have our capacity buffer constraint. And the capacity buffer is excess capacity that's held not to be used, but to 
be able to react to additional demand that we have. So a manager might set that to be some minimum amount and then the ex excess capacity that we actually have should be greater than or equal to the minimum capacity buffer. Now in this version of this particular model we just have these set to zero but eventually we're going to likely change that and we'll have um, some capacity buffers. And so that would mean that the excess capacity minus the minimum capacity buffer is greater than or equal to zero if we put the minimum capacity buffer, uh, move that to the left side. Excess capacity is already calculated here as the production capacity minus units produced. And then the minimum capacity buffer is on line five. Some of these values are negative, but clearly when we solve the problem with solver, uh, those negative signs will change. All right, and then the last constraint is the inventory buffer. That would establish some minimum invent ending inventory. So we would require that ending inventory to be greater than or equal to the minimum inventory buffer. That allows us to quickly respond to changes in demand. If we subtract the minimum inventory buffer from both sides, then this quantity here on the left needs to be greater than or equal to zero. So right here, we'll enter the ending inventory minus the minimum inventory buffer on line four. Now, we've actually now got, because we've formulated the constraints this way, a very simple way to enter these into Solver, so we'll do that now. If we open up Solver, here's what we see in Solver. For the objective, we've got the total cost here in cell N49. And that's going to be minimized. And then the changing cells, we had all in one range. So we'll re-enter those just to make this clear. The changing cells would be all of these decision variables. And because they're all together here on the sheet, we can enter them as one range. That makes that simple. And I'll just re-enter the constraint. The constraint, there's many different constraints. But all of the values here for each month have to be greater than or equal to zero. It allows us to enter them in one box. So we would just enter all of these values here and then make them greater than or equal to zero. And that is, will satisfy all of the constraints. We want to use the simplex LP method because all of these functions and constraints are linear. So if we click Solve, we get a minimum total cost of 3,696,823, and our unit cost is $100.16.